Good morning. It is just still morning, not quite pizza time for me. Um, I'm, I'm Jane Secker. I'm a senior lecturer in educational development at City University and I'm co-presenting with Thomas. I'll let him introduce himself. I'm a learning technologist uh, based in the School of Arts, Social Sciences and Health Sciences at City. Thanks, Thomas. Um, and we're, yeah, we're both in the learning enhancement and development team at City. And uh, this is about a project that we had funded um, very generously by the Centre for Distance Education that we undertook um, last year, last academic year um, at City with our international politics department. So we're going to do a double act. Um, I'm just going to take you through um, uh, a quick overview. Um, we thought we'd just tell you a bit about the project, how we did it, um, what we were trying to achieve, obviously, um, and then some of the findings. Um, the, there is a, a, a much longer report. Um, we have a short report available, but also a longer report with a lot of uh, quotes from our students. We're going to concentrate on talking a bit about asynchronous group activities and a little bit about students' experiences of using pre-recorded lectures. Um, and some recommendations, a bit of further reading of hopefully, as we say, time for plenty of questions. So just to start us off, um, the project team involved um, in, in this uh, work actually included um, a wider team than Thomas and I. Um, we had a, a, a research assistant, um, Sarah Remus, who we were very fortunate to, um, to get some of her expertise into doing the, the data analysis. Um, we were also joined by our colleagues, um, who also support the School of Arts and Social Sciences, um, are led by Peter Cogan, but also Ger uh, Geraldine Foley and Sarah Ney, um, who conducted a lot of the, the actual focus groups. Um, and then, of course, um, colleagues uh, from the Department of International Politics um, were involved in this study. What we thought we'd do is just tell you briefly a bit about the department. Um, it's, um, I mean, City is is not is known more, I think, for um, some other subjects other than more, you know, social sciences such as international politics. But we do have um, a department with with quite a large cohort actually of undergraduates, six hundred and fifty undergraduates. Um, 90 postgraduates. Um, we're reflecting obviously on um, the, the, the teaching that took place um, in the academic year 2020 to 2021. So um, the pandemic had already happened. We'd already had the kind of more emergency remote teaching where we wanted to explore some of the more planned responses to teaching online. And I've just put a link um, in um, to uh, the open access um, report that we submitted to CDE, which is in our repository um, at City as well. Um, so this just gives you a bit more detail about the, the, the types of courses um, that students were studying, um, but fairly reading heavy um, courses is what I would say. Um, and, uh, you know, courses um, such as our, our BA in history and politics, um, international political economy obviously, and, and international politics are the two biggest um, programmes. But we have got a department of history now and quite a small um, cohort of students studying those subjects. We have a joint programme with sociology um, and then we also have um, an undergraduate BSE just in straight politics. The master's programme is much, much smaller um, and you can see there's a bit of a focus there on diplomacy, international politics, global political economy, various things like that, human rights. Um, just to let you know a bit about what we were actually trying to understand. So um, we were aware that our international politics department had been very innovative with the shift, um, the, the rapid shift to online teaching. Um, they were very um, early adopters of using quite a lot of um, asynchronous activities for students. They were doing a lot of work using Teams um, and sharing documents, collaborative documents on OneDrive. Um, and we were very interested in understanding what the student perceptions were um, and their preferences in relation to actively engaging with these individual and group um, learning activities. Now, what ended up happening was that in the focus groups that we did, we found out lots more interesting things as well. So we've actually got um, four um, longer sort of sub questions of things that we wanted to do. We wanted also to see how 
their um, online learning using resources. Um, so we will talk a bit about their use of recorded lectures um, today. Um, also compared to also some stuff about quizzes as well. Um, and um, to also try to have a look at some of the analytics that we've got. So compare what students told us with, with what we could find out and to see whether there were any patterns there based on student demographics. We're not gonna go into those two areas today at all. Um, so how did we do it? Um, well, we um, started with a, a survey of students um, and then we um, had that open um, to all students. So potentially um, uh, sort of 770 or so students could have answered the survey. Um, we um, followed that up then with some focus groups. Um, we were looking to um, put students into year groups where possible and also to talk to uh, postgraduate students to see if we could see any differences in student behaviours according to their year of study. And uh, we did eight focus groups in total. Um, so quite a number of um, students um, that were involved. And we did um, offer an incentive to students. So they got vouchers um, if they if they uh, took part in the, the survey and the focus groups. Um, and we did some analysis then using um, Excel for our quantitative data and NVivo for coding the qualitative data, which is what Sarah, our excellent research assistant, did a lot of work on. Um, I'm going to hand over to Thomas now, and um, he's going to tell you a little bit about the findings, um, particularly related to um, the asynchronous group activities. So take it away, Thomas. Thanks, Jane. I'm going to be relying on you, if that's okay, just to go through uh, the slides. I'm your slide, slide monkey, slides. yep. Thanks so, so much. So just a few of the, the main findings to the asynchronous learning activities. Uh, you'll see that actually more students engage less frequently. So there's quite a, a large number of students that didn't engage at all, zero times per week there on the right. And the most common uh, amount of engagement by a student was uh, once or, or twice a week. And then on the left, high frequency engagement. And one thing I'll just briefly mention here uh, as a little bit of context, uh, is, I'm sure this is a relatively common experience, but the Department of International Politics is quite big, uh, 25 to 30 academics teaching on this. And as is often the case, I think, there are a percentage of academics that are really engaged in teaching, others perhaps prioritizing uh, research or they have other sort of commitments and, and interests. So within this particular department of, let's say, 25 academics, there are five key kind of people who really wanted to explore how to get our students working together uh, asynchronously offline and some additional context uh, more about the students and the academic team would be that 70 percent of our students at city are commuter students uh, on average commuting an hour uh, each day and there's kind of been a known challenge really with engagement or a sense of community even things like turning up to lectures so it's quite a a bold move for this department and these particular sort of five people pushing it to to try and get students to to work in groups asynchronously and you can see there's a discrepancy that perhaps we didn't get into exploring this but uh, it could be that the five highly engaged academics really use these methods more and although the aim was to provide this across the department uh, it i think is more of a sort of cultural change over time that would take uh several iterations to get a more even kind of use of asynchronous activities. Okay, that's a long digression. I won't do that on every slide. Uh, I'll just stick to the bar chart on this one. Uh, and again, we're interested in this idea of... Okay, darling, working, it's time, isn't it? Working as a group, uh, not just on the kind of design specific activities, but perhaps in a more open informal way uh, so again you'll see that zero times a week was was quite significant uh, by far uh, the biggest response was that students didn't do this so it's quite a difficult thing to do and obviously this was taking place during the period of uh, emergency remote teaching a pandemic going on so that was an additional challenge so uh, there were some instances of 
a lot of engagement, but by and large, uh, it was sort of one to two times a week or, or not at all. Uh, thanks, Shane. To the next one, please. So this isn't surprising if you put any of the literature around uh, group work. Students generally don't enjoy working in a group for all sorts of reasons, particularly if assessments involved, uh, because they're worried about you know everyone pulling their weight, uh, freeloaders, that kind of that kind of thing. So, unsurprisingly, vast majority of our students prefer to. Uh, I think that's the wrong way around, actually, the colouring on that. But anyway, uh, moving on. OK, so this question in the focus groups was around uh, the experience of learning asynchronously, how, how students found it. So we know a lot, and Jane will speak a bit more about the benefits of asynchronous lectures in terms of flexibility and, uh, and being able to, to note, take and replay, etc. Uh, and I mentioned commuting already, it's a big issue for our students. Uh, also, that kind of links into timetabling. Sometimes it's not possible to sort of schedule teaching uh, when we were in a face-to-face in a -face blended context all on the same day. So when students had to commute just for one session, that impacted on, on attendance. So not having the commute obviously was a benefit for this student. Uh, but again, the group side of things, difficult really in the sense of maybe students not having a culture of working together in groups and that was made perhaps even more difficult by trying to work together in groups online when it not so much there's not so much group work uh, happening face to face generally in the school of arts and social sciences I think it's fair to say uh, it's, it's hard to to change your teaching like that when the model really is uh, lectures and then uh, seminars which again don't always have group activities in them okay next one please Shane so communication always an issue uh, we have international students as well quite a few of them so time differences and that whole mediation of technology and um, I'm sure you've heard a lot about things like Zoom fatigue and people having to, you know, live their personal social lives in a mediated way because of the pandemic through Zoom as well. And so when you're learning also through uh, a mediated environment of technology, I think that lack of physical cues uh, and interactions made it difficult. I think also it's worth mentioning that the responses that we had to both the surveys and the participation in the focus groups were more weighted towards year one. So those students hadn't really had a chance to meet each other at all. So again, that made things really difficult for them to gain some sort of sense of who they were studying with. Uh, okay, next one. Thanks, Shane. Okay, back to you. I think I was going to say, I think it's back to me now. Yes. Yeah, I was just popping something in the chat as well about um, what you were saying um, in, in response to Leonard's point as well about students not necessarily liking the group activities. We are being asked to do a lot in the School of Arts and Social Sciences to help staff um, design good group assessments and activities. So I think that is a, a bit of a, a reflection on what might have happened during the pandemic. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the findings from um, students' experiences of recorded lectures. I've got a longer paper um, that I will be presenting in March at the INTED conference um, uh, about this, um, and um, hopefully I'll be able to share that with you um, fairly soon. So I've written this up in a bit more detail. Um, we did um, look at how students used um, some of the, the resources that were made available to them, and um, there were some interesting findings about um, the use of pre-recorded lectures, um, and um, some really interesting quotes. We um, did some analysis and basically looked um, at the benefits um, of pre-recorded lectures according to the sorts of things students were telling us in these focus groups. It surrounds 
four main themes really um, about their learning. So one is about flexibility and autonomy. Um, one is about um, promoting deeper learning. Um, one is related to um, accessibility, um, specifically a lot of the work that we've done on um, uh, captioning of, of lectures, obviously being very um, well received by students. And then um, about the, the benefits of recorded lectures for revision. I've got just a couple of quotes um, on each of those themes. Um, so on the theme of um, flexibility and autonomy, um, one of the students here telling us, um, that learning online was actually a an efficient way to learn. Um, it meant they could also, um, I'm sure it's something many of us do, uh, listen to things at uh, twice the speed um, and then saying that they had far more time in their day to actually um, to spend to do, to, for leisure. That's a, a shocking thing, but obviously spending it to do more learning um, because they could listen to the lectures at double the speed. Um, interesting um, one oh, that isn't working quite how I was expecting that to on deep learning let's no I can't get that to come up sorry about that um let's just go back a slide uh to there sorry um so on deep learning yes that was meant to go bold and that hasn't happened um somebody's um actually talking about how they found it a really amazing experience um they were saying in their first year which presumably was taught um on campus face to face they wanted to prepare for lectures beforehand they never got the powerpoints before so they came to class unprepared and so actually they're saying that having these pre-recorded lectures um really helped um, promote deep learning. Um, and then um, in terms of accessibility, um, lots of good quotes we had from students. Um, and um, as uh, Thomas alluded to, we do have um, uh, students um, that are also international students, so English isn't their first language, but we have students with all sorts of learning um, differences as well. So this was a quote from a student saying that they found it really helpful um, to have transcripts and also being able to kind of move around, um, fast forward, etc., with pre-recorded lectures. And then finally, which I think um, you know many findings about recorded lectures show um, that they're really helpful for revision purposes, so students can kind of go back um, they can look at things um, and listen again and that some of them saying that they felt like it was kind of um, you know it was as if it was a fresh lecture all over again um, which they found it re really useful far more useful than just having a powerpoint so some really interesting findings coming out of that um, we made some recommendations um, following the report um, so we're going to just go through um, some of those between us so Thomas I think you were going to do these first couple of slides Thanks, Shane. So I think most of these seem pretty much like common sense and perhaps in a way the challenge with these recommendations links into earlier sessions today. Uh, Leonard was mentioning how time consuming it is to write good quiz questions. So I think a lot of this is known, but how it's resourced and how much time program teams are given to structure their online modules. We have pretty extensive guidance that we put together, uh, a checklist essentially that summarizes good practice in setting out your Moodle modules, but in practice, there's a lot of variation really uh, in that. And, and that does link into the, the usual kind of questions around uh, workload allocation models, et cetera. Metacognition, I guess that was mentioned earlier on as well. So I think that idea of kind of monitoring your progress, uh, that helps. It's a quick and easy thing to do. And again, the thing about breaking up your lecture recordings uh, is, pre is fairly straightforward. Uh, but it can, unless it's, it can again, unless you have sufficient support, take time to do that. Next one, thanks, Shane. So quizzing and polling, unsurprisingly, students found that engaging. They enjoyed that, obviously very helpful as well in terms of formative assessment and making the link between uh, what they were doing asynchronously. They found it extremely frustrating uh, when if students were asked to do activities or some sort of preparation for a synchronous session and then there was no mention of it or link or poll or question relating to it they found that really demotivating and, and essentially they it, it was a significant factor in stopping them engaging asynchronously because they thought nobody's monitoring it nobody really uh, is 
concerned about the effort I put in, so why should I keep doing it? Okay, last point is fairly straightforward as well. Uh, obviously beneficial to make the links between what's happening synchronously and asynchronously. Jane, Thanks, I think you're doing yeah, next one. Thank you. Yeah. Um, again, I mean, I think some of some of what we found here, we it's not that we weren't telling uh, staff to do this already. Obviously, um, ensure that they were aligning their um, activities with the session learning outcomes. I don't know how many times you have to keep telling people though that that that's the sort of thing to do. Um, we ended up pointing to quite a lot of resources to help support staff. So we were fortunate to have um, one of our, our colleagues in the international um, politics department who'd put together a blog um, with a lot of ideas for small group teaching um, activities. It's proved to be really, really valuable for people teaching in lots of other subject areas as well. So um, we were recommending, encouraging, uh, reminding in staff um, to, to, to come up with, you know, sensible ideas um, for, for and, and not to feel that they had to reinvent the wheel to sort of to be able to see some of the, the activities were actually fairly simple and, and some were fairly low tech as well. And we pointed them to the Advanced HE Student Engagement Toolkit as well, um, which, um, you know, I think just another opportunity to remind staff of things that already exist. Um, in terms of some of the, the recommendations about the kind of social interaction side of things, um, we had some really, um, I think, interesting findings about um, you know, students saying that they weren't always given clear instructions and expectations about what what to do. Um, it was actually something I took on board in the modules I was teaching to try to be very clear before a session, before you come do these two or three things and, and you know remind people because I think sometimes we think it's it's obvious it's on Moodle it tells them what to do um, and actually we were getting from international politics students no this wasn't clear um, and they didn't al always know um, you know what they should be doing where they were in the schedule what was coming up next week um, and needed to be done um, students also mentioned um, that that um, you know it was actually very um, related to how clear their lecturer was as well. Um, we took any of the kind of identifying um, details out of, out of the responses we got, but students would talk about um, individuals being particularly good at doing this. Um, some, some of the staff, obviously, um, as, as Thomas has said, five of them were particularly engaged and some were mentioned about um, in relation to that. Um, and then also, you know, to just make that link again, if you're doing live teaching sessions to go back um, to talking about um, asynchronous activities, giving students feedback if they participate. And again, that was something I really took on board for my teaching, that if I was expecting some people to do something before they came to a session, to actually mention that at the start of the session. Um, we also, um, and we did a lot of work during um, uh, the, the 2020 um, around um, you know, pre being prepared to teach online, getting st giving students um, activities that can be kind of low risk so they can get to know each other, um, these informal opportunities. Um, we, we seem to spend a lot of time talking about icebreaker activities and things to staff. Um, and that was something um, that students clearly appreciated. Um, and actually they did um, seem to, to really uh, appreciate interaction with their peers um, and their lecturers um, as being something that was really beneficial to their learning as well. So building in the opportunities for this interaction really did seem to be something that, that students wanted and recognised helped with their learning. Um, I think we are at the end there. We, we you know, this, um, some of doing this report was also to draw on some of the existing literature that was out there to, to be able to compare what we were doing, but also to find um, some evidence that would really help um, our staff at City, um, you know, to sort of say, well, what works, what doesn't, and, and here's what students told us. Um, so if you do want to um, have a look at our, our further, um, if you want to have a look at our report in full, um, it's available there. And please do get in touch with Thomas and I um, if anything jumps out and you've got any more um, uh, the things after reading it. But I think we've got enough time for some questions now. Hopefully we've allowed, um, I think by my calculations, about nine minutes. So um, I'll stop sharing and um, please let us know what your questions are. We'll go back and have a look as well through the chat.